Hello Year 10, Year 10, Year 9, basically Year 10 aren't you? Welcome back to your next living room lesson. So last lesson we did quite a mammoth lesson where we introduced leisure and rural areas and the impacts of leisure in a rural area and what we're going to do for the next two lessons is have a look at a bit of a case study of a uh, rural kind of site that's used for leisure. So what you're going to need today is your exercise book, a pen and a ruler, your phone and the Seven Sisters picture sheet. All right so before we get started um Here's your job and memory. So pause your videos, uh, scan the QR code or click the link, open the link um, and have a go at the questions. Please put in your name. Please all have a go at this because it's really useful for us to know who is actually doing the lessons. OK, so I have actually already said the name of the place we're going, but hopefully you've all forgotten already um, wh where we're going. Well, we are actually going. We will be going in year 10. Get excited. So. The place that we are studying today, here are three images of it. So it's a place quite local to us. It's a place I'm sure a lot of you have been before. Um, it's a place near the coast, a place with a beautiful river, lovely long walks, uh, also big woods behind it where lots of people go cycling. Hopefully you're all shouting now. I know where it is, Mr Smith. We are today having a look at the Seven Sisters Country Park. All right, so please can you write in a title which is Leisure at the Seven Sisters Country Park. Write that in, underline it with a ruler for me, and we will get started. So, this big red blob here is the Seven Sisters Country Park. Um, you guys are, oh, you're just off the map. Here's the bottom of the word hassocks here. So, that's where you guys are. So, it's not very near far from us. It takes about 40 minutes, 35 minutes to get there. And as I mentioned, those of you doing GCC geography, we will all be going there in year 10 because one of your days of field work will be out to the Seven Sisters Country Park. So, you're all going to go there and explore this wonderful place. But what I would like you to do first is tell me the location. So, I want you in your books to write three bullet points and those three bullet points need to be descriptions of the location. Now remember when you are describing somewhere's location you need to use compass directions okay so I'm going to give you one now to get you started but you need to come up with three of your own. So Seven Sisters Country Park is south west of Polegate. South west of Polegate all right so have a go at answering that in your books three quick descriptive points. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at that. Some of the key ones I'm sure lots of you will have done is that Seven Sisters Country Park is southeast of Brighton. It is west of Eastbourne, south of Alfriston. You could also have put something more simple and said it's on the south coast. So Seven Sisters Country Park is a country park, surprising. And obviously last lesson we learned about the kind of five main different ways natural areas are managed. And we didn't really talk about country parks very much, so I kind of skated over that one because I knew we were coming back to it. So a country park is an area of countryside that is set aside for public recreation. So it is a place that is designated as a park for the public to go and visit and do a range of different activities. The parks were set up by local authorities, so it would have been set up not by the main government, but there would have been funding from the government, but it will be local authorities, so the East Sussex County Council, or it might be the Eastbourne City Council, will have set up this uh, country park. And they're generally quite small, but they're in a fairly densely populated area because they want to be able to attract people to go there. There's no point in it being in the middle of nowhere where no one's going to visit it, because the whole point is that it is set aside for public recreation. It's meant to have people go and visit. So the country park is now within the South Downs National Park. So not only is it kind of following the aims of a country park, but it also has that extra level of protection of being in a national park. There's also a farm in the area, a working farm. So again, kind of fostering that economic value that we know they want in the country parks. Um, yeah. So, what? sorry, I forgot what I was doing there. It's been a long day. What I'd like to do next is pause your video and I just want you to write down the definition of a country park. So a country park equals, and then the red bit, all right? Okay, so hopefully most of you were able to print out the sheet with these four pictures on. Don't worry if not, not a problem. Just make your looks, your looks, your books look a little bit more exciting. So if you could now get this sheet in front of you, if you've got it, if not, just have a fresh page. So get a fresh page 
Um, and what we are going to have a think about is we're going to have a think about a range of different attractions that we get at the country park. So what is it that people can actually go and do? So the first thing I'd like to do, either write it around your pictures or write it off a mind map that says attractions in the middle. I want you to summarise this information about the main attractions in the country park. Okay, so the key bits you should have got, they're in red, so it's quite easy for you. 280 hectares, so it's fairly big. Unspoiled stretches of coastline. Unspoiled being quite a key word, because actually, if you think about it, the south coast um, has got a lot of urban areas. There aren't many bits of coastline which haven't got people living there. From Brighton, if you go east, Yes, if you go east, you've got, um, you very quickly will end up in Salt Dean and then New Haven and then Seaford. If you go west, you've got loads of places. You've got, uh, you obviously get Hove, then you get Portslade, then you get Shoreham, then you get Lansing, then you get Sompting, then you get Worthing, then you get Chichester. All of the south coast is kind of these big urban areas. So for there to be this area of kind of fully protected, unspoiled coastline where no one goes, that is quite significant. It's also within an AONB because you've got these beautiful cliffs, you've got river valleys, you've got an estuary, you've got meanders, you've got loads of important features there. There's a wide range of habitats that different animals can use. Um, so you've got chalk downlands on the cliffs, you've got lagoons down by the water, you've got the water meadows by the rivers. So you've got a load of different types of ecosystem and habitat. And it's also an SSSI, so it is protected because it has a lot of rare animal species there. So what I'd like you to do next, still with your pictures in front of you, is I want you to go to this street view here. I want you to have a little rummage around the country park and I want you to just add some more little attractions that you can pick out. OK, so pause the video, scan the QR code and then add any more attractions that you can see to your mind map. OK, so I have now got the street view up in front of me. And what we can see, first of all, here is the entrance. So it actually already tells you some of the facilities here. So uh, we've got a toilet, we've got an information centre, we've got a cafe, we've got cycling routes, we've got picnic areas. So there are some of our attractions that you could have got. If we turn around, here is the Vista Centre. OK. So let's go up the road a little bit. And if we look down into our visitor centre, here's the cycle hire. And then down there is a path down to the visitor centre. If we spin all the way around, here is the country park. Let's see if I can go in the car park. I don't think it will let me. So down the end of the car park, there is, oh, I'm in, I'm in. We come all the way down here. There is a water sports site, so you can do water sports at the Seven Sisters Country Park. You can do paddle boarding. Uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed with how I'm spinning all this round, actually. And then let's go back out. Okay. Ooh. And then along the road a little bit more. Let's go in the other entrance to the other car park. Oh, I've gone past. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to go in that car park. Oh, we're in. And up here. Oh, look how far we've got. Here is the other car park. These are the Friston Woods. So up here, you've got loads of walking trails, you've got cycling trails all round the woods, okay? So hopefully you've managed to add, let me see, will it take me to the actual park? I don't think it will. Oh my goodness, it will. We're in the National Park. Isn't that good? So here we are walking along the concrete path that goes straight through the park. How far will it let us go? Oh. <laughs> So we've got some people dog walking. Oh, that looked like a school trip to me. Let's keep going. Can we get all the way down to the beach? Do, do, do. Isn't this cool, guys? It's like we're all at the country park together. 
We're getting there. Very rainy day. It always rains when we go to Seven Sisters. Look forward to that. Oh, it looks like another school trip there. Not one of our school trips, is it? Do I recognise himself? No, I'm not on here. He looks like a cool teacher to me, though. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm having a lot of fun here. Can you tell? Up here, we have got a campsite. So there is also a campsite. Right, I'll we'll stop there because otherwise I'm just getting a bit too excited, aren't I? How do I get out of here? Let me out. Okay. So hopefully what you've now got is either your pictures with loads of different attractions and things you can do, or you've done a little mind map in your books. So next thing I want you to do. So here is a range of the different activities you can do at uh, Seven Sisters Country Park. It doesn't add up to 100 because obviously you can go and do more than one activity. Um, so what I'd like you to do is have a look at this list of data and I want you to first of all put the top three. So write down the top three att attractions and the bottom three attractions. So the most popular attractions you can do at the country park and the least popular. And then looking at this, I want you to think, right, there are loads of different activities here. So what four groups of people do I think might visit the country park? So what different kind of people might go to the country park? Okay, so hopefully you've picked out the top three things to do there. I'll go for a walk. That's the main thing you ever see people doing there. I go there for walks all the time. I love it. Um, cycling, also lots of people cycling there and bird watching because as I mentioned there's lots of rare birds and species here so it's a really kind of important bird watching site. The least popular activities are collecting bait, boring, uh, sorry if any of you collect bait, um, the campsite, not many people use the campsite anymore, um, and artists, so artists going there to draw the landscape and in terms of groups of people that you could pick out from here we've got some obvious ones so we've also got dog walkers, we've got cyclists, we've got bird watchers, um, we've got families. If they're visiting an ice cream van, we're going to assume they're probably families going there. School trips, you always, you'll see when we go, there are always loads of school trips there. So what we're going to finish today by doing is a, some maths. Yay! And we're going to be doing some maths, having a look at a survey that was created of the National Park. So the staff who work there made a survey of the country park, sorry. Um, and what they did was they counted the amount of cars coming into the car park. They then worked out the average number of people who they think would be traveling in the cars um, to work out the average number. But rather than standing by each car and counting every single person that came out, they just kind of did an approximate guess. Why do you think it might be that they didn't actually stand and count every single person coming in and, in and out of the cars? It would probably be down to the fact that that would be weird to stand over each car. One, two, three, not really worth your time, is it? Okay, so they would have done an approximate guess because actually they don't have the manpower to be doing um, a count of everyone. So the first set of data you've got here is the weekly figures for January. So the amount of cars and people visiting each week in January. So the first week, second week, third week and fourth week. So what I'd like to do first of all is pause your videos and answer these five questions based on that set of data, okay? Okay, year nine. So I've been doing a bit of quick maths over here. So our first question, how many people did the park estimate would visit in January? So for people, we need to add up all four of these numbers, which would give us 18,148. Calculate the total number of cars. So again, we add up all of these numbers, which is 6259. And then the third question is work out how many people the park estimated were in each car. So to do that, you need to divide the total number of people by cars, which gives us 2.8. So they were est estimating that there were 2.8 people per car. Um, in terms of whether you think this is a good way of assessing visitor numbers, what do you think? Do you think it's good? Is it bad? Why? Um, how could this data be shown effectively? So we could show this on a bar chart because we've got discrete categories. Um, so we could have two bars, we could have cars as red bars, people as blue bars and have it each week of the month would be quite a good way of showing this data. Right, we're gonna ramp up our maths a bit now. So what we've got here is the total visitor numbers per month. 
So what I want you to have a go at now is working out the mean, median and range. Now I know you've done these in maths, I know you have, so you should be able to have a go at these, but I've also put quick definitions of how to do these three different types of maths for me. So have a go at working out our mean, median and range. Okay, so what you've been doing here are finding different ways to work out the averages, because the mean, median, range, mode are all different types of working out an average. So the first one that you should have done is our mean. So in order to work out the mean, you would take the total number and divide it by the total number of groups. So our total number is 327,000, and there were 12 different months. So if we divide that by 12, we get 27,500. So the mean average is 27,500. Now, in order to work out your median, what you needed to do was put them all in order. So you've to, this is a bit faffy, so I've, here's one I've done earlier. I've put all of our numbers in order, and then what we have to do is find the middle number, because the median means the middle number. So I've already worked out that the middle is somewhere between 25,200 and 26,700. So in order to work out our middle number, we need to first of all work out the difference. So we've got 8 plus 800 plus 700, which equals 1,500. My maths is terrible. So the difference is 1,500. If we divide this by 2, we've got 750. So we now need to add 750 to our highest middle number, 25,200. So we would have 25. So our median, sorry, lots of writing here. Our median value is 25,950. And then in order to work out our range, we have to take the lowest number from the highest number. So 12,200 from 51,800 is 39,600. So we've got three different averages here. So we've got the mean, the median, and the range. Obviously we can see our mean and our medians are quite similar. So looking at these, we can see that maybe that's quite a good way to work out your average because we've got some quite similar numbers here for you. But the median isn't always the best number because it's the middle, it doesn't take account of the fact that actually our highest number was 51,000, which is quite a distance away from this middle number that we've calculated, okay? So often the mean is considered to be one of our best ways of working out an average. Okay, so the last bit of maths I want you to have a go at is working out a percentage increase. So, or it could be percentage decrease, percentage change we'd call it. So what I want you to do is work out the percentage difference from July to October. So in order to do this, we will do this one together, although you're going to have to go gentle on my maths here. So first of all, we have to work out the difference between July and August. So July is... 51,865, and then October is 12,201. In order to work out the difference, we need to take it away. So four, six, six. Oh, I hate maths. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. Is So the difference is 31,664. So then we have to divide the difference by the original number. Oh, there is no way I can do this in my head. So 31,664 divided by, and then times it by 100. Right, I'm gonna have to pause the video on this one because my phone's videoing, my laptop's got the PowerPoint up. I can't do that maths in my head. I just can't. Okay, so I'll be right back. Three hours later. I'm back and I realised that my mental maths was terrible and I worked out this wrong. The difference is actually 39,664. So we divide that by our total number, um, which and then times it by 100 gives us 76.47%. So the percentage increase, sorry, that's percentage decrease, isn't it? So the percentage decrease from July to October is 76.47%. We got there in the end. Okay, well done guys. What you should have today is the location of Seven Sisters, the country park definition, the different attractions and activities, 
the top and bottom three activities and the groups of people who visit them, and then all of those maths. Right, well done. We will be having a look at Seven Sisters again next lesson, and I will see you very soon.